sound booth ready? You got the satellite activated, so it's being broadcast not around the world, but also around the solar system, all that stuff working. All right. Okay, well, as um, stated last week, we are winding down our series on the Pentateuch. We have one more narrative to look at, and then we'll turn our attention to some questions about the Pentateuch that we'd like to address um, before we finish the series up. Before we proceed with today's material, I should probably circle back and clarify something from last week and um, that whole business about the archaeologists finding ancient artwork in some remote cave that predated the Great Flood. That was just a playful story, all right? All those depictions of the Nephilim were fictitious, and so if you thought that I was being serious about any of that, you might want to go up to Teresa afterwards. Is Teresa here? Ah, oh, she didn't come today. All right, well, maybe she's watching and encourage her to let her know that she wasn't the only one. Okay, so, I was going to have some fun at her expense here. So to her credit, she started to get suspicious when I brought up the picture of the Incredible Hulk. So, <laughs> all right. Currently, we are looking at a few examples of how to apply some of the principles that we have learned to narratives in the Pentateuch. And so today, for our last example, I have chosen a a troublesome event that is recorded for us in chapters 18 and 19 of Genesis. And it is a story that we are all familiar with. Even non-Christians know the story. And it may very well be the least favorite story in the whole book of G Genesis, perhaps in the whole Bible. And whenever it is mentioned in children's Bible story books, it is drastically watered down. And there are good reasons for that. And this, of course, would be the account of God destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. And the events immediately leading up to that and the events that immediately follow. Now, since this is our last example, I'd like to quickly review one more time some of those main principles about interpreting and applying the Old Testament narratives. And this will be helpful before we dive into our text today. And hopefully after this, they will be permanently cemented in your mind forever and ever into the ages of ages, okay? Okay. So, this will be familiar, but let's go through it again. Um, narratives are the most common type of literature in the Bible, and there's a lot of narrative in the Pentateuch, like all of Genesis, a good chunk of Exodus, and Numbers. So, let's start with what narratives are. Narratives are purposeful stories retelling the historical events of the past. For the scriptures, that purpose is going to primarily be theological. That is, the story being told will tell us something about God, about his character, his works, his will, uh, what pleases him, what angers him, and of course, something about his plan. Everything is part of a great plan that God is faithfully working out according to his own purposes. Therefore, the purpose of a narrative isn't really going to be that of giving us a moral lesson, as though it functions like one of Aesop's fables, where the reader is looking for a moral to the story. And this is probably the most common mistake people make, especially preachers, quite frankly, because they are eager to make these Old Testament stories relevant, you know, as kind of a way to exhort their congregations to do this and not do that. You know, Joseph should not have been alone in the room with Potiphar's wife. Cain should have controlled his anger instead of killing his brother Abel. Noah should not have taken his first drink of wine, you know, and so on. Of course, lessons can be found, and we will see that today, but we will miss the whole point if that becomes our main focus. Any moral lessons that can be found are secondary. The primary reason for the narrative is to teach us about God himself, which includes that of providing us the backstory of how he is working through certain events and people and situations to raise up for himself a covenant people who will bear his name who will represent him to the world, and how that then plays into the grand story itself of what we call redemption history. Secondly, narratives are historical. All of these stories in the Pentateuch are true accounts of certain events that actually took place. There was an actual Abraham who had an actual nephew named Lot, and Lot lived in an actual city named Sodom, which was corrupted by actual sexual perversions. 
and then was destroyed by actual fire raining down from the sky. With each narrative, either the author is a first-hand witness or he is drawing upon reliable sources who themselves were witnesses. So with this definition in mind, let's review quickly again the parts of a narrative. First, there is a scene which deals with the setting where the story takes place, who is involved, the situation itself, and so on. Each scene has a context. There were past events that have led up to what is now taking place. Nothing takes place in a vacuum. Everything is connected to something else. Uh, then there's the plot, and closely related to that is the plot resolution. Typically in biblical narratives, there's some kind of conflict or tension that surfaces that needs to be resolved, and the way it is resolved all contributes to the forming of the plot. Plots include some sort of climax that serves as the central act of the narrative. The climax may not actually be all that dramatic, but it is nonetheless a turning point. And in today's story, all of these characteristics of a plot will be quite evident. And the climax, um, you know the story, it will be quite dramatic. Another crucial ingredient of all narratives are the characters who are involved. And it is typical to have the good guys and bad guys. But most characters, if you look at them closely, will be both good and bad, both wise and foolish, and so on. And Lot will be one such example of this. However, one character, the main character, who is always good and always wise, is, of course, God. He is the ultimate hero, if you will, even if he isn't explicitly mentioned. And again, he is the one who's making sure that everything that happens will ultimately serve his eternal purpose, which includes making all things right, especially at the end of the age, where everything, all of history is headed. Next, we have dialogue, what is said by the characters. Dialogue is frequently introduced to inter is frequently used to introduce or highlight the main point or points of a narrative, and this too will be evident in today's passages. And finally, every narrative has a narrator, the one telling the story, namely the author. And he is not just telling a story, there is a reason for telling the story he tells and the reason for how he tells it, the way he tells it. And he chooses what to include and what not to include, and typically he doesn't comment or explain things or offer his own personal evaluations. Sometimes he might, but he generally lets the story speak for itself. And we will find that to be the case today as well. And another important piece, one more in our review that must be covered here, uh, something that we keep coming back to time and time again, is that every narrative in the Pentateuch should be viewed from the perspective of three different levels. And hopefully you have remembered this. Uh, there is the first level, the bottom level, the actual events and characters of the story itself and all that transpires from it. There is also a second level in which the individual story is part of a larger story, a larger plot of God raising up a covenant people to bear his name from whom will eventually come the Savior of the world. The purification that takes place in Sodom and Gomorrah is, of course, part of this larger plan. And then there is the top level, the third level, which deals with the whole universal plan of God, the, the, uh, the grand plot or the grand story, which includes everything from the initial act of creation to the fall of man and the ongoing power and effects of sin and the need for redemption to Christ's incarnation and sacrifice in the coming eternal kingdom of heaven. And we could refer to this top story as the story of redemption or redemption history or even God's master plan. This is the top narrative above all others. It has a scene, a plot, a plot resolution, characters, and of course, a crucial dialogue. So there you have it. I think this is probably the fourth or fifth time that we've covered that, and hopefully it's all locked in, right? We could all pass the quiz on it, correct? All right. Very good. So for this morning, the events that we are mostly interested in take uh, place in chapter 19. If you haven't turned there, you might want to at this time. They're in the book of Genesis. But we need to start back at the beginning of 18, that chapter, to get a good feel of what is going on. Now, we're not going to take time to read chapter 18, but if you have your Bibles, you can follow along as I just kind of offer a basic overview here. In the first half... Verses 1 through 15, we have three mysterious visitors who appear to Abraham. It seems that one of them is the Lord and that the other two are his agents or emissaries, angels. They tell Abraham and Sarah that within a year she will be with child. Knowing that she is now an old woman, well beyond childbearing years, she finds all this quite comical. You know the story. She just laughs out loud about the whole thing. 
and she is rebuked for that, for not taking it seriously. In the second half of the chapter, the attention now turns to Sodom and Gomorrah. The three visitors say their goodbyes, and Abraham goes to see them off. The Lord makes a passing comment about where they are now headed, and he kind of like, uh, you know, he's kind of like having this uh, thing going on where he's trying to decide whether he should even say anything to Abraham about what they plan to do. But he goes ahead and tells Abraham. They plan to check out personally what the Lord has heard regarding all the wickedness in those two cities and in the surrounding region. Verse 20, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is immense, and their sin is extremely serious. All right, look at that again. The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is immense, and their sin is extremely serious. The Lord wants to find out for himself whether this outcry justifies the destruction that he is intending. You know, he just needs to be sure. Abraham knows what goes on in those cities and in that surrounding region. He knows what they will find. He is also aware of the fact that his nephew, Lot, and his family lives there in Sodom. Desperate to save his nephew, Abraham tries to appeal to the Lord's mercy, even negotiates with them. Will you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 who are righteous? You could not possibly do such a thing. Won't the judge of the earth do what is just? Abraham, to his credit, has a point. Certainly, God is able to do whatever he chooses to do, but will it be just? And so the Lord concedes the point and agrees. But Abraham keeps haggling him for an even better deal, so to speak, getting him down from 50 to 45 to 40 all the way to 10. And the Lord agrees. If he can find just 10 righteous people in Sodom, he will spare it. And Abraham is probably convinced at this point that this is quite doable, given that Lot and his family would be included in that number. I mean, how hard would it be to come up with just a few more? But as you know the story, even with that, you can't even find 10. This now brings us to chapter 19. So we'll start there with verse 1. The two angels entered Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in Sodom's gateway. When Lot saw them, he got up to meet them. He bowed with his face to the ground and said, My lords, turn aside to your servant's house, wash your feet and spend the night, and you can get up early and go your way. No, this, no, they said, we would rather spend the night in the square. Okay, obviously they want to see for themselves what the city is like at night. But Lot urged them so strongly that they followed him and went into his house. He prepared a feast and baked unleavened bread for them, and they ate. All right, so a few things here. If you're keeping track, there were originally three visitors from heaven. Now there are only two. The text doesn't say, but we could assume that the third visitor from heaven went to Gomorrah. Or, more likely, the third visitor was the Lord himself and has decided to send his two angels instead, his two agents, his trusted agents, and they will simply report, and he will, the Lord will simply rely on the report from them about Sodom. And since Sodom was the major city in the region, it would serve to represent the sinfulness of the whole region. So people have wondered why God is using angels here to tell him what he and his omniscience already knows and different reasons have been suggested for that. But in the end, we just have to be content to simply say, that's the way God wanted to do it in this situation. All right. Now, as we see here, Lot was an upright citizen, hospitable, generous, warmly welcoming these two guests, eager to please. And it could very well be that he served as some sort of leader in the community uh, there. We are told that he sat at the gateway, which is a common expression of referring to someone who serves as a, as a leader, or more specifically, as a judge. Judges usually sat by the city gates, public places where legal and business transactions were finalized. Either way, Lot knows quite well the wickedness of the city, and yet he is willing to put up with it because he liked the good life of Sodom's society. And on this, we might actually think back to chapter 13, where <clears throat> Abraham gave Lot the choice of where to live. And he chose, Lot chose the region of Sodom because it was green and well watered. That's what the Bible says there. It was prosperous. The fact that it had a reputation for rampant and unrestrained sexual perversions did not deter him. Verse 4, 
Before they went to bed, the men of the city of Sodom, both young and old, the whole population, surrounded the house. They called out to Lot and said, where are the men who came to you tonight? Send them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Lot went out to them at the entrance and shut the door behind him. He said, don't do this evil thing, my brothers. Right? The mob who surrounded the house includes men from every sector of the city and every age group. The homosexuality in this city had become both pervasive and generational. No doubt, the children in Sodom grew up in a society where pedophilia was a common practice. The young probably refers to teenage boys who themselves had been victims, forced into homosexual acts much of their lives, and now unfortunately have developed an appetite for the same. The author's words, the whole population, is not hyperbole. The ESV translates it to the last man. And um, we can say it's not hyperbole because we know from Abraham's bargaining with the Lord that there aren't even ten righteous people in the whole city. Given that there is a population there, children are being born, men were having sexual relations with women as well. And so to be clear, they were not homosexual or bisexual in the way our society today has conditioned us to think about these sorts of things, that everyone has some sort of fixed sexual and psychological orientation that you are born with. I mean, are we really to believe that this is what's going on in this whole town, in this whole region, that all of them from birth were wired a certain way? Not at all. As is the case today, this is a matter of rejecting moral restraints so as to satisfy virtually any and every sexual desire. And here in Sodom, as we see, not just anything, but even everyone was fair game, regardless of one's age, regardless of one's gender, regardless of one's willingness. Paul probably had Genesis 19 in mind when he told the Romans that God turns people over to the depravity of their sins, allowing that depravity to run its natural course. And though the men there had sexual relations with women, as we will see in the next verses, they actually preferred relations with other men. They craved what is unnatural over what is natural. One can only, I mean, you know, really imagine the cesspool of sexually transmitted diseases this place, you know, had become. We also see from the account here that their drive to indulge their sexual lust was to the point that consensual sex, that virtue that supposedly sanctifies every kind of sexual encounter and practice, was at this point meaningless to them. Upon seeing these two visitors, from that moment on, the intent was to have sex with them willingly or unwillingly, plain and simple. And the fact that they first surrounded the house before even addressing those inside further reveals their hostile intentions from the very beginning, which is then fleshed out in the demand made by this mob, which is essentially bring them out so that we can take turns raping them. And in vain, Lot tries to stop them. Verse 6. <clears throat> Lot went out to them at the entrance and shut the door behind him. He said, don't do this evil thing, my brothers. Look, I've got two daughters who haven't been intimate with a man. I'll bring them out to you, and you can do whatever you want to them. However, don't do anything to these men, because they have come under the protection of my roof. Lot tries three different things to ward them off. First, he appeals to them as brothers. You know, out of your respect for me and friendship with me, please don't do this. And this is telling, for it shows us that Lot saw himself as one of them. He may not have participated in their perverted lifestyles, but on some level, he did identify with them. Secondly, Lot offers his own daughters in lieu of the two strangers, and he makes the swap more lucrative by pointing out their sexual innocence. Here are my virgin daughters. Do to them as you would please. Now, to us, this is just horridly unthinkable. How could he even come up with such a despicable idea, much less offer it? 
Well, there is a way to explain it, but the explanation itself is pretty dark. In offering his two virgin daughters to be raped by this mob, we see that a piece of Sodom, sadly, has taken up residence in Lot's own heart. Sexual purity and integrity is no longer something to be treasured and protected. Having lived in Sodom now for some time, he has succumbed to many of its values, or we should say lack of values. Namely, if the situation calls for it, anything goes. Ultimately, then, there are no moral limits to sexual behavior because anything can be justified. So, again, while it is an honorable thing to protect his guests, his higher priority are, obviously, his two daughters who are under his care. And sadly, he doesn't even seem to flinch in making them available to this pack of demented perverts. Now, by a bizarre twist, this anything-goes attitude towards sex, characteristic of Sodom, and even in the thinking of Lot, survives in these two daughters of Lot, well after the destruction of Sodom. And we'll see this later on in the chapter. Lot continues to plead with this raucous crowd with yet another appeal, a third one. He points out that if they carry out such shameful behavior, it would be an appalling breach of hospitality. Hospitality requires protection. And at Lot's invitation, the strangers had received sanctuary under his roof. And in that culture, this would be a very major offense. And to violate this custom would gravely tarnish the reputation of the city, branding it as unwelcoming. But as we will see, they could care less about that at this point. All they want is one thing. Their sexual lust for these two strangers has driven them to madness. And so they respond to Lot quite forcefully. Verse 9. Get out of the way, they said, adding, This one came here as an alien, but he's acting like a judge. Now we'll do more harm to you than to him, than to them. Uh, they put pressure on Lot and came back came up to break down the door, but the angels reached out, brought Lot into the house with them, and shut the door. They struck the men who were at the entrance of the house, both young and old, with blindness, so that they were unable to find the entrance. So at this point, the two heavenly witnesses, as we see, they had just heard and seen enough. This blindness was not really punitive, but defensive to keep them from breaking down the door. We could assume that through the night, the fumbling crowd uh, eventually disbanded, and that this blindness persisted, allowing Lot and his family to escape the next morning. Verse 12, Then the angel said, Do you have anyone else here, a son-in-law, your daughter, anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons and daughters, or anyone else in the city who belong to you? Get them out of this place, for we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against his people is so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-laws who were going to marry his daughters. Get up, he said, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-laws uh, thought he, were, he was joking. So the sons-in-law appeared to be as blind to the inevitable as the men of Sodom were. This prediction about destruction is just too far out there for them to take seriously. And um, they are, these guys are not mentioned again, and so it is possible that they, in their skepticism, remained behind. At daybreak, the angels urge Lot, get up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. Because of the Lord's compassion for him, the men grabbed his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters. They brought him out and left him outside the city. As soon as the angels got them outside, one of them said, Run for your lives. Don't look back. Don't stop anywhere on the plain. Run to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, No, my lords, please. Your servant has indeed found favor with you, and you have shown me great kindness by saving my life. But I can't run to the mountains. The disaster will overtake me, and I will die. Look, this town is close enough for me to flee to. It's a small place. Please let me run to it. It's only a small place, isn't it? So I can survive. And he, one of the angels, said to him, all right, I'll grant your request about this matter to and will not demolish the town you mentioned. Hurry up, run to it, for I cannot do anything until you get there. Therefore, the name of the city is Zor. Zor uh, is related to the word small. 
So it will take all morning to get Lot out of Sodom. In fact, the angel has to literally drag him out of that town. And as you read these verses, this sense of both urgency and frustration is very prevalent. The moment of judgment has come. Lot and his family need to giddy up, but Lot in particular drags his feet. The angel's attempt to rescue them is floundering because this family is only half-heartedly engaged in this. The sun had risen over the land when Lot reached Zor. Then out of the sky, the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, burning sulfur from the Lord. He demolished these cities, the entire plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and whatever grew on the ground. But Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. Early in the morning, Abraham went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down on Sodom and Gomorrah and all the land of the plain, and he saw the smoke that was going up from the land. It was like smoke of a furnace. So it was when God destroyed the cities of, pl- of the plain, and he remembered Abraham and brought Lot out of the middle of the upheaval when he demolished the cities where Lot had lived. All right, so before chapter 19, there was no mention of Lot's wife. And so it's possible that she may have been from Sodom herself or from the region. Either way, it's obvious that she has strong affections for this city, even stronger than Lot's. I mean, it is one thing to get Lot and his family out of Sodom, but it's a completely different thing to get Sodom out of them. Indeed, Sodom would have eventually destroyed them all had the Lord not first destroyed Sodom. Lot departed, going on now with verse 30. Lot departed from Zor and lived in the mountains along, along with his two daughters because he was afraid to live in Zor. Instead, he and his two daughters lived in a cave. Then the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man in the land to sleep with us, as is the custom of all the land. Come, let us get, let's get our father to drink wine so that we can sleep with him and preserve our father's line. So they got their father to drink wine that night, and the firstborn came and slept with their father, and he did not know when she laid down or when she got up. The next day, the firstborn said to the younger, look, I slept with my father last night. Let's get him to drink wine again tonight so that you can sleep with him, and we can preserve our father's line. That night, they again got their father to drink wine, and the younger went and slept with him. He did not know when she laid down or when she got up. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The firstborn gave birth to a son and named him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites of today. The younger also gave birth to a son, and she named him Ben-Ami, and he is the father of the Ammonites of today. How do you do a children's Bible story book? (laughs) Is it even possible? You have to either change stories like this one, and water them down so much that they don't really mean anything, or you just skip over them. But here it is again, alcohol's ability to loosen one's sexual inhibitions. Last week it was Noah that we looked at. Today, we're, you know, this time it's Lot. This incest obviously demonstrates Sodom's influence on Lot's daughters. No sexual boundaries, nothing is off limits, depends on the situation. Well, you can just justify anything. Lot felt justified in surrendering his daughters to the mob so as to protect his two guests. Now his daughters feel justified in surrendering themselves to him so as to continue on with the family lineage. The region has been destroyed, but the sexual ethic of Sodom and the region lives on. And in this episode, the author gives us the backstory regarding the origins of the Moabites and the Ammonites, who will become persistent enemies of Israel. What a heavy, oppressive, dark, somber story this whole chapter is. You know, the whole thing is very sobering. Four major themes from Genesis 19. God's swift judgment on the residents of Sodom. Lot's close attachment to that wicked society. God's merciful sparing of Lot from the doom. And the rebirth of Sodom there in the cave. So let's now turn our attention to how Genesis 19 fits into the bigger picture, starting with that second level, the story of Israel. Now we've done the first level, let's now look at the second level. Well, this is actually answered for us back in the previous chapter in verses 18 through 21 of chapter 18. 
As you will recall, the Lord seems to hesitate in, call, in telling Abraham his plans, but then he decides to go ahead and tell him everything, and he has two reasons for that. First, God tells Abraham that all the nations would be blessed through him. But for that promise to be fulfilled, there were some cities there in the region of Sodom that first had to be removed. That is, that they really are as wicked as they seem, which they were. And secondly, the judgment of this region will be a demonstration of God's holiness and righteousness, of his intolerance of such grievous sins. And Abraham is expected then to pass this lesson on to his offspring, teaching them the ways of the Lord down through the generations. You know, how should one live knowing how God dealt with the residents of Sodom and Gomorrah? The story would serve for God's covenant people as a sober lesson for all the generations to come. Essentially, this is another occasion where Yahweh sets himself apart from all the other deities. He shows himself as the one true God, as seen by his great power. And he is a God who is holy and righteous, one who judges sin. And he is a God who expects his chosen people to be holy and righteous as well, so as to serve as his faithful representatives. <clears throat> and so part of that is cementing, part of that is cementing into Israel's collective memory both the events and the lessons of Sodom and Gomorrah. And this then leads us to the top level, how this narrative contributes to the grand story of redemption history, God's master plan. There are probably a number of different ways it does that, but the main one would have to be, again, the powerful lessons that, there are, that, that are there for all to see. Lessons that not only pertain to the ancient Hebrews, but actually to the whole human race for generations to come, for centuries, for millenniums to come. One can see this, how the story of Sodom and Gomorrah has significantly shaped the sexual ethic of God's people all through the ages right up to the present day, including those cultures that have been influenced by God's people. You know, having a law that says, thou shalt not, can be effective, but not nearly as effective as an actual event where the forbidden sin encounters the wrath of God. It's one of those stories that everyone remembers. Even those who have never heard the story, who have never read the story, know what it is about. Here's a good example of that. Here is a... Um, <clears throat> Here's a t-shirt at a gay rights parade a few years ago in London. It demonstrates the point. The message on the t-shirt is disturbing. It reveals the intentions of the modern-day LGBT movement. But it does show that virtually everyone knows what the story is about, even those who think that it's a myth. I think it's also telling that in many cultures, including our own, um, many cultures have adopted the word sodomy to refer to certain immoral actions. The word is not slang. It's a legal term used in the court of law. So again, this disturbing story and the warning that comes from it, it's ingrained in our collective conscience and has no doubt helped to restrain uh, sexual perversions through the centuries. If we think things are out of control now, we can only imagine what our world would have been like had there not been a Genesis 19. It has served as kind of a reference point. Another way the story contributes to the greater plan of God is that it provides the world a tangible preview of what is to come. Genesis 19 illustrates that God is willing to judge sin even to the point of raining fire from heaven upon an entire region, destroying whole populations of people. And this bolsters all of those warnings in the Bible about a coming day of judgment being both sudden and severe. In light of Sodom and Gomorrah, it would be utterly foolish to dismiss all of those prophecies and warnings. Jesus, Peter, and Jude all referred to Sodom and Gomorrah as not just a warning to be sobered by, but also as a motivation for living godly lives. There is a coming day of judgment. It will come suddenly. It will be bad. Fire will rain down from heaven yet again. There will be mass destruction. People will suffer. People will die. Find it all through the New Testament, the teachings of Jesus, the letters of Paul, the others, in the book of Revelation. And it will be because of rampant homosexual behavior and pedophilia and rampant premarital heterosexual behavior 
and adultery and lust and greed and stealing and killing and idolatry and witchcraft and drunkenness and selfishness and pride and lying and laziness and coveting and gluttony and dishonoring parents and pursuing dishonest gain and breaking vows and cheating and malice and revenge and rage and so on and so on and so on. Consider these words from Peter taken from his second letter. The Lord condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. So like the great flood in chapters 9 through 12, this story here in chapter 19 serves as a warning to not just Israel, but to the whole human race. The world is on notice, and this story about Sodom and Gomorrah shows that God means business. Finally, for this morning, we need to take a um, <clears throat> couple minutes to address the various attempts in recent history to reinterpret Genesis 19 so as to make it politically correct. And different revisionists have asserted three alternative interpretations of this account. We don't have time to get into these with any great depth, but it will be easy enough to see how each one fails to convince. The first one goes like this. The sin of Sodom was not homosexuality, but inhospitality. In can you say it? I can't. There's always a word I can't say. In hospitality. All right. Now I lost my place. <clears throat> Lot was violating the town's custom by entertaining guests without the permission of the city's elders. That's, that's what the claim is. And this was largely based on translating the word in verse 5 as know them rather than have sex with them. So if this were true, then we would expect Lot, since he is the guilty one, to be the one destroyed by fire from heaven and that the angels would have helped everyone else escape. Um, but more than that, Lot's response to the crowd about pleading with them to not do this evil thing, you know, this whole business of him offering up his daughters and so on, none of that would make any sense. A variation of this view is that all the men in the city came out in order to make sure that these guests were not spies to check them out but the same problems remain. You just can't make the story fit that scenario. Another claim, second one, is that the sin being condemned is not homosexuality per se, but homosexual rape. And at first, it seems that this might actually be a valid point. But I want you to follow the logic here. If, hypothetically speaking, the two angels willingly consented to the sexual demands of this mob, then, according to this view, no sin would have been committed, and God, therefore, would not have destroyed the city. Is that what we are supposed to believe, really? And the fact is, no one in Genesis 19 was raped. And for that matter, there were no homosexual acts committed in Genesis 19. The reason God destroyed the city wasn't because of anything that happened on that particular day, but because the people were so steep in their sexual immorality. It was so widespread and prevalent, they by choice were enslaved by it, well before the angels ever arrived. We are told that their sin was inviting God's judgment. Remember those words, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is immense, and their sin is extremely serious. You know, it's a problem well before we get to the events in 19. Most likely, rape was a common thing. But rape was just one of many sins resulting from a, from a much deeper depravity. You know, anyone who happens to be guilty of rape is also going to be guilty of all sorts of other sexual offenses and, immor and immoralities that have led up to that. There is a progression. One sin leads to another. The third reinterpretation claims that it was wickedness in general, not homosexuality that brought down God's judgment. Certainly the residents of Sodom and Gomorrah were wicked in many ways, all of which would have invited God's wrath. The prophet Ezekiel actually points that out. But on this particular question of what really is at the heart of the issue here, the Bible does provide an answer, and it's found in Jude's short letter. Verse 7, Likewise, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding city, towns committed sexual immorality and perversions, and serve as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. 
The word translated perversions means other flesh or strange desires, denoting something unnatural, something other than what was naturally intended by God. And so, yes, every wickedness under the sun was probably going on in that region, but it is clear from Jude's letter that the primary offense was that of sexual immorality and sexual perversions. All right, <clears throat> next week, well, something much more positive and uplifting, we're going to talk about slavery <laughs> and polygamy. <laughs> and um, Josh Birch will um, lead us in that. So those are positive subjects in comparison. All right, and Josh is actually going to close for us this morning, so I'll invite you at this time. So, yeah, as Wendell said, much cheerier topics next week. Uh, but uh, in seriousness, um, again, we uh, thanks for the work that you put into that, Wendell. I think that was um, instructive for all of us. Um, so if you'll stand, we will close with these words from Ephesians. Paul writes, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Those words you're dismissed to um, serve each other in love. <laughs>